Well, no, it's the audio of the FX. Oh. But it's not. Right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Financial Management 101 for Small Social Entrepreneurs and Small Business Owners, which is being presented by RSA Canada and the School for Social Entrepreneurs Ontario. My name is Marjorie Brands, and I'm the Managing Director of SSE, uh, the School for Social Entrepreneurs, which, as the name would suggest, is a place for people who are starting up uh, social enterprises that address an environmental or social problem. Uh, if this is your first time getting to know SSE, we're thrilled to welcome you and hope uh, this won't be your last, uh, your first or last uh, engagement with us, and that we have many, many programs that uh, might be of interest to you. Uh, after the webinar, we will be sending out a link to all of the learning programs at SSE for your um, perusal. So you're listening in today uh, using your computer speaker system by default. If you'd prefer to join over the phone, uh, click on the join audio button at the bottom left of your screen and select join by phone and the dial in information will be displayed. You'll have the opportunity to ask questions orally by raising your hand during the Q&A and I'll explain how that's done when the time comes. But if you don't want to wait and want to ask a question before Q&A, you can also submit text questions to today's presenters by typing your questions into the chat box. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and I'll be collecting these and addressing them when we have our Q&A session. In case you're wondering, we'll be sharing the PowerPoint presentation from today's session by email, so you can feel free to sit back and relax and not have to worry about taking notes. I'd now like to introduce our sponsor, RSA, and the webinar topic, which is Financial Management 101 for Social Entrepreneurs and Small Business. Uh, first, a word about RSA. So RSA Canada is a leading Canadian general insurer distributing the broadest, home of, uh, broadest range of home, auto, business, marine, and travel insurance products. RSA is a very generous supporter to SSE in Canada and the UK. And in addition to doing webinars like this one, uh, RSA staff regularly mentor and uh, coach SSE students, host Dragon's Den events, and we're thrilled they can bring their core professional expertise to the sector. Today's presentation is about your cash, cash that you have and cash that you hope to have in the future as, an, as a social enterprise or a small business. Um, three RSA Canadian, or three, sorry, three RSA Canada staff uh, from the financial management team have prepared today's presentation. So first we have uh, Kenny Yu, and Kenny is a CPA candidate, a uh, recent BBA graduate, and current Masters of Accounting student at the Schulich School of Business. He has a background in uh, public sector uh, mining and with a focus on internal audit. And he's en route to complete his CPA designation in 2018. Peter Zhao is a graduate from the Masters of Accounting program at the University of Waterloo and is on pace to receive his CPA designation this year. Peter is currently making an impact in the financial reporting, reinsurance, and taxation departments of RSA Canada and previously worked at the Velocity program at the University of Waterloo where he provided financial advice to young, aspiring entrepreneurs, and he hopes to be able to share some of his experience uh, with you all today. Finally, we have Kelly Bragg, who is a CPA and the leader in the financial accounting uh, department at RSA. She received her CPA <coughs> designation in 2007 and has since obtained her designation as a certified internal auditor. Kelly has worked with Ford Motor Company of Canada, Loblaws, PwC, KPMG, um, and both of those in Canada and Australia. She's currently working in RSA Canada's finance team, primarily focused on financial reporting requirements to the UK. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over the presentation to uh, Kenny, who will take you through the slides for today.
Oh. Hello, can someone type in a message just to hear that you uh, confirm that you can hear the presentation? Okay, so all right, so Peter, I think you should be able to talk now. Oh, okay. okay, hello. Um, all right, so let's just jump right into it. So I'll be talking to you about financial management, the first part, and after I'll pass it on to Peter to continue. So first we'll talk about what is financial management. So financial management mainly centers around three main concepts, which is planning, organizing, and managing financial resources. So this can be something as simple as seeing whether the company is making a profit to planning your expenses to the next 10 years. And why do financial management? Well, there are several benefits to financial management, and here are just a few. So the first is to allow you to gain insight and understand the organization better. For example, if your organization has multiple lines of business or services, you can see which ones are making a loss and which ones are making a profit. The next is it allows for better financial decision making. So seeing uh, where to allocate your resources to lines of business that are not doing as well. And the next is to allow for measuring financial performance. So seeing whether or not uh, your performance is meeting your expectations. Next, it allows for financial flexibility, which is, uh, for example, seeing whether or not you have enough cash, for example, to meet your obligations, such as your bank loans. And lastly, it may be required by external parties. For example, banks uh, might want to have a set of financial statements to see uh, for bank loans and also investors and the CRA, which is the Canadian Revenue Agency. All right, so budgeting. So the first thing I'll go through for financial management is budgeting. And basically budgeting is a process of planning an organization's finances. So there are actually many benefits to budgeting. And the first one is to plan for future expenses. Uh, the next is to make better expense decisions and increase the bottom line. So for example, seeing whether or not um, the company is spending too much or too little on certain expenses. Uh, the next is to measure how responsibly money is being spent. So again, seeing whether you're overspending or underspending, and the last is to plan for your future expansion. So maybe um, lowering your expenses so you have more capital expenditure for future expansion. So creating a budget is very simple. Um, I've laid out four simple steps that uh, everyone can follow. So the first one is to lit list the budget categories that are used. For example, this can be transportation expenses or supplies expenses. And the second is to list all expenses that the organization incurs. So what you might want, might want to do is go through your receipts for the past month and see all the expenses that uh, the company has incurred. Next is to assign a budget category for each expense item. So the budget category is basically a bucket and you, might, and you want to put all your expenses into each bucket for expenses. For example, uh, all the uh, airfare maybe, uh, oil, sorry, gasoline, uh, or uh, taxi fares can fall under the category of transportation. Next is to assign a dollar figure to each budget category. So here's an example of a example of a budget. So again, with the transportation, maybe um, I or my company, I want to spend a thousand dollars for each month for transportation. So you can put that down and have an actual monthly spending as well. So that sees um, by the end of the month, you want to collect all your receipts and see how much you actually spent on transportation compared to what you budgeted for the month. So you can see whether or not you're overspending or underspending, and this allows you to uh, make better decisions on lowering your expenses if you feel that you're spending too much. All right, so the next topic I'll go into is bookkeeping, and this might be uh, a scary topic for some because first thing that comes to mind might be accounting, but it's not <laughs> as scary. So I'll go through some simple uh, basic bookkeeping. And what bookkeeping is, is the keeping record of the financial situation of the organization. So with today's software, there's actually a, uh, a lot of uh, bookkeeping uh, softwares that make it a lot easier to keep uh, new accounting softwares. And um, you don't need to have a professional designation to use them. So I'll go through that at, um, near the end of my part for some of the accounting softwares that are available. When with bookkeeping, you can generate three financial statements, which is a balance sheet, an income statement and a cash flow statement. So I'll go through the balance sheet and income statement while my colleague Peter will go through the cash flow statement. All right. So what is a balance sheet? So a balance sheet essentially just tells uh, 
the user what the company owns and what the company owes. And some of the common terms of a balance sheet are assets, liabilities, and owner's equity. So assets are something that the organization has control over, provides future benefits, and also has a monetary value. For example, a computer would be an asset because the organization paid for that computer, so there's a control over it. It provides future benefits because it helps, uh, it helps you uh, uh, do some work on the computer and also has monetary value because you paid money for it. A uh, liability is a financial obligation of an organization that has arised from past economic events. So a bank loan would be a liability because there's a past economic event where you borrowed money and there's an obligation to pay it back. And owner's equity is basically any residual amount. And usually an owner's equity is what someone puts into the company, plus or minus your net income or loss, and hopefully that's an income, and any drawings that the owner takes from the company. So a simple balance sheet equation is that assets minus your liabilities equals your owner's equity, or you can rearrange that to assets equals your liabilities plus your owner's equity. And basically, uh, with a balance sheet, you can gain some insightful information on how well the company is performing. For example, does the company have enough cash to meet its short-term obligations or bank loans that are due within a year? So the balance sheet can provide some of that information. So here's an example of a balance sheet for Latch Coast Flower Shop, uh, an imaginary company that I made. So on one side you have, on the left side you have the assets, uh, while on the right side you have the liabilities and owner's equity. So as you can see, the total assets should equal to total liabilities and total owner's equities, which is 1,100. And this is just a simple layout for a balance sheet. There's also different ways. Uh, for example, assets can be split out between current assets and uh, capital assets, while liabilities can be split out to current liabilities and long-term liabilities. So current is essentially anything that are used up or are due within one year. All right, so the next is the income statement. So an income statement basically tracks the financial performance of a company for a specified period. For example, this can be annually, quarterly, or monthly. And it basically assesses how well the company is performing. And the general format for an income statement is revenue minus your expenses equals to your net income. So here's an example again with Latch Pro products. And your sales revenues are laid out at the top while your expenses are grouped together. And the remaining amount is either your income, which is, would be a positive, or your loss if it was a negative. So with the income statement, there's actually a lot of information that you can derive from it. For example, if you rearrange your, uh, your costs to be either variable expenses or fixed costs, you can see, uh, get some more information from the, how well the company is doing. For example, your costs of goods sold are any costs that are directly attributed to the product or services being sold. And this is positively correlated with sales. The more sales you have, the higher your cost of goods will be. And your sales minus your cost of goods from this uh, equation here is would equal to your gross profit. So this basically tells you how much the company is making based on the operations, the four operations of the company. And lastly, your fixed costs or anything that our content does not fluctuate with sales. For example, you'd have to pay rent or electricity regardless or not the company is selling their goods or services. And with this information, you can actually, uh, you can actually uh, find out how much, for example, how much units you need to sell of the product you're selling in order to break even. So I have an example here where, um, where I separate the fixed costs and the variable costs, and by doing so, I can decide how much uh, products I need to sell from my company in order to break even, which is to not make a profit or a loss. So for example, if my company sells uh, tables, for example, for $60 each, and it costs $10 to create one table, and the total fixed cost, which is uh, my rent, or for example, the electricity bills, uh, that totals to around $2,500, I, I can see how many units I need to sell in order to break even. So. Uh, in the second equation here, I've written let x, be a number, let x be the number of units that need to be sold in order to break even. So we have an equation 60x minus 10x minus 2,500, which is my fixed cost, equals to zero. And basically 60x minus 10x is the gross profit that I was talking about previously. So that's how much I'm making from my core operations. And 
that subtracting 2,500 equal to zero would equal to my break even. So some simple uh, algebra, we can rearrange the equation to see that uh, 50x, which is the gross uh, profit per unit, might equals to 2,500. And with that, we can calculate that we need to sell 50 units in order to uh, break even. So that's the minimum amount I need to sell in order to uh, not make a loss. So the next thing I'll talk about is internal controls. And this is something that uh, might be difficult to wrap um, your head around. So uh, I'll provide some examples later. So it's also important to have internal controls in the company in addition to bookkeeping. Because internal controls help uh, in our organization ensure that the objectives are achieved. And furthermore, um, they can prevent the potential for inefficiency, errors, and fraud for the company. So I'll just give you some examples, and this might help you better understand what internal controls are. So here we have four examples, and the first one is creating a separate bank account from, for personal affairs and your business affairs. For example, you don't want to mix up what the company has and what you have uh, for yourself. So you want to keep those separate in uh, your, for example, cash, you want to keep those in separate bank accounts. Uh, the second is to reconcile your bank accounts on a periodic basis. So for example, this is keeping the checks that you receive and uh, tracing them to the bank statement to ensure that all the checks have been deposited and that the correct amount is being deposited. The third one is to segregate duties. So for example, if you have an employee who uh, invoices, uh, collects the cash payments, records the journal entry, and also um, deposits the bank account, that's uh, deposits the cash in the bank account, there's a risk that the, uh, they have, the employee has the opportunity to commit fraud not to say that they will if they did have the opportunity, but it's just an important measure to put in place. So by separating these, uh, these uh, responsibilities, there's a less of a chance because when there's another person watching, there's less chance of them of committing any fraud. And uh, an example of fraud would be, for example, recording the correct journal entry into your books, but depositing the incorrect amount into the bank account. So this can be prevented if uh, you can segregate the duties for employees. And the last is to track all sales. So you want to ensure that when you collect the money from uh, customers that you're correct, collecting the correct amount and that, um, that it's paid on time as well um, as agreed in the uh, agreements. And this can be the same for suppliers as well. So just ensuring that the correct amount is paid and it's paid in a timely manner. So these are just some um, examples of internal controls. There's actually a lot more, but I just haven't um, said in this presentation. All right, so financial management tools. So basically, how do you do the financial statements? Uh, what tools can you use? So here are just some example of financial management tools. So for example, um, QuickBooks, Xero, Zoho, FreshBooks, these are all um, softwares that you can use, accounting softwares that you can use. Uh, some of them are online, so on a cloud. So um, it's easier access and whichever you use just depends on the need. So they're all customi customizable to your own needs of your businesses or your personal preferences. I've used QuickBooks before, which is the first one, the green circle, and it was very simple. Um, basically, I could list out everything and uh, financial statements could be generated automatically. So that was uh, easy to use for myself and it fitted the organization needs for the company I was working with. And also, you might want to hire a professional with accounting knowledge, so maybe somebody will see, see a CPA, um, just so that they can have a fresh eyes to look at the company and maybe give some advice. Um, yeah. So with that, I'd like to pass it on to Peter for the cash flow statement and his part as well. Hi, I'll be going over the second half of the presentation. And as a note regarding questions, we are tracking them. So if you send them through privately now, we'll address them at the end of the presentation. So to start off with, uh, I'll be starting with the cash flow statement. So the cash flow statement shows how cash is generated and used by a company. A company can be profitable but still run out of cash. So it is a key metric to determine how your company is doing. It's useful for managing cash to pay bills and identify areas of concern. There are many types of cash flow statements, but the one that I will be focusing on is a cash flow projection. So Kenny went over a budget uh, before, and a cash flow projection is kind of a more advanced budget. It shows how cash is expected to flow in and out of the business. It's used for setting sales goals, planning operating expenses, 
and saving for large expenditures. Uh, it's a different way to look at your finances, and I guess it's closer to reality than an income statement would be. Uh, the basic formula is cash disbursements, which is money you spend, minus cash receipts, which is money you receive, is your equals your required funding. Uh, cash flow projection is often required if you want to acquire a bank loan, and it's used by investors and management uh, to assess your business plan and to see if, uh, if your business will be sustainable into the future. So I have a sample cash flow projection here. It's a lot of uh, data, so I will be going over each section in detail. Uh, this is a sample uh, projection of a company of a company in its first five months of business. So going right into it, uh, I've highlighted the opening, which is so we're assuming the business requires seven thousand dollar investment to get going. This could be in the form of equipment, a down payment, or the first payment to employees. Um, so you can see I've put seven thousand dollars in the investing investment line here, and if you look at the net cash uh, uh, row that shows the amount of cash that's required during this time period. So you can see we need a $7,000 investment, we need $7,000. Now in the required funding row is how much funding you're, expect, you're expecting to receive at this time period from external sources. So I put $10,000 there, and this is one of the ways management can use this uh, projection in order to determine cash needs. Uh, we're projecting about $10,000 $10, of cash needs in order to sustain the business in the beginning. And at the bottom of every cash flow statement, you have your ending cash, which is the amount of cash you expected to be left with at the end of each time period. Now, when we start the business, we had an investment of $10,000 and we're investing $7,000, so now we have $3,000 at the end. For each time period in your cash flow projection, uh, you carry forward the ending cash balance as you're beginning for the next, next time period. So when we started the business, we had $3,000 of cash to spend. We're starting month one with $3,000. If you look at the second row of this cash flow projection, it shows your cash receipts. This is the amount of money you're expecting to generate uh, through your business each time period. Uh, this is a difficult exercise to perform, and in the beginning, it will be difficult to project how much money you'll receive in the future, but as the business is uh, running, you will get better and better at this, and it's a good way to make sure that your business is on track by comparing how much money you've actually received as opposed to how much money you're expecting to receive. Um, and then you have your operating expenses. These are, uh, this is money you need to spend in order to keep your business running. I put some example categories here, for example, salaries, rent, supplies, cost of goods that you sell. Um, there are many different types of expenses with different types of organizations, and there are many different ways to estimate these expenses. Um, but this is important in order to keep track of how much money you need to spend in order to keep your business running. So you can see in the total column, we're expected to spend $2,000 per month in order to the business running. Next you have your non-operating expenses. These are kind of atypical one-time costs that you uh, kind of infrequently incur. So you can see we have put the original investment of $7,000 in the non-operating expenses and, and these costs um, are important to keep track of because they're often large uh, just by nature. For example, if your initial investment is expected to last you two months and then you need to make a reinvestment, this projection is a good way of determining how you're going to get that cash at that time to make that additional investment. Another item here is your debt payment. Uh, for example, if you uh, borrowed that $7,000, then you can plan out how you're going to repay that money in the future. This is also a good way to track how much money you can take out of the company as an owner's salary uh, in order to uh, compensate yourself for running the company. So after non-operating, you have your net cash, which is the money you began with at the beginning of the time period, plus the money you received, minus all the money you've spent. And this is a good way of making sure that you have enough money to pay all of your expenses at each time period. So you can see here, if you look at month two, uh, we're actually projecting to be uh, mi uh, missing $700 at this time period. So if you look at the required funding row, we can see that we we're projecting to need an additional $700 in the second month in order to keep the business running. So this is how you can know that oh, by month two, I need to find a way to get $700 or I'm gonna be in big trouble. And this also illustrates why uh, focusing on cash is an important metric because if you have, it, even if you have a lot of assets, uh, if you can't pay your bills, then a lot of issues occur that are extremely difficult to solve and may even result in the company uh, folding or the, the bank putting additional restrictions on you. 
so next I will talk about the social impact of the equation. So I guess a social entrepreneurship is different from a typical for-profit business in that for a typical for-profit business, the goal of the company is to make money. If the bottom line is I want to make as much money as you can. Whereas for a social entrepreneurship, there's the making money part, but there's also the social impact part of the equation. And both of these parts work together uh, in order to make the company successful. And it's important to be able to quantify both parts of this equation. So there's two pieces of social, uh, there's two components of social impact. You have your social costs and you have your social benefit. So social costs are additional social, environmental, or cultural costs that are incurred above and beyond what a normal business would typically incur. And social benefits are benefits that may or may not be quantifiable that help achieve a business's mission or vision statement, again, that a typical for profit business would not necessarily be able to achieve or even care about. Um, so first I'll go over social. Uh, costs. So it's important to analyze social costs separately from normal business expenses. Uh, for example, social costs include wage premiums. For example, you may pay certain segments of the, of the population additional wages over what they would typically get in a normal marketplace. You may have lower productivity uh, due to the way that you operate your business in order to provide a positive social benefit. You may have additional training and support that you provide that other businesses may not provide or you may have discounted pricing for items that would, that would provide a social good that, again, businesses typically wouldn't provide. Now, if you're providing these kind of social costs, it's important to be able to quantify how much exactly are you paying, in a, for example, how much are you paying in addition to what the market would pay for wages, how much are you charging less uh, in terms of pricing, and you need to weigh this business, this is a business strategy that you're using, you need to weigh uh, the strategy versus how sustainable it is. Are you going to be able to continue doing this in the future? Uh, you need to weigh the business performance versus uh, how much of the mission that you're achieving. You need to weigh the cost that you're incurring here versus the benefit that you're generating out of these costs. And you need to be able to quantify the extra resources that you require in addition to what a typical business might, may incur. So next I'll talk about social benefits. Now social benefits is difficult to make a list of social benefits as different businesses have different goals, but almost universally the goal is to make a positive impact, may, may, uh, whether it's environmental or cultural or other social impacts. Uh, but there are other benefits that you may not uh, consider. For example, social uh, businesses are typically resilient to recessionary markets, and a recessionary market is when the entire market is in a downturn and everybody is losing money. But the social impact will be the same regardless of how the market is doing. So typically a social entrepreneurship uh, has that benefit. And there are possible grants, funding, and donations that are typically not available for uh, for profit business that uh, social entrepreneurships have access to. For example, there are special government grants that are available to social entrepreneurships that a typical business may not qualify for. So here's an example. Now this is just an example, but here's a possible way to quantify your social impact. So if you have here your accounting income, which is how much money you're making, and then you have your social impact section. So you have your social benefits, which may be a number or it may be a list of qualitative benefits that you're expected to generate. And then you have your social costs, which is possibly a number, possibly also a list of things that you expect to incur. And you compare these things against each other. You compare what benefits have, uh, how you achieved your mission, how you achieved your vision, uh, what kind of benefits you've generated against the extra cost that you're incurring to generate these benefits. And then you can take a look at, you know, your imp the impact that you're making and consider, are these costs I'm generating, uh, am I using, am I incurring these costs to the best, in the best way that could generate the maximum benefit? And again, this is a, a good way of showing your investors or your debtors or the bank that, your company is achieving what it's set out to do, and you're able to put a uh, put facts behind what you're saying and put facts behind what your company is doing. It's a good way of showing people that the company is doing what it's uh, purpose to do. Uh, next, I will talk a little bit about business financing. Uh, there's four main ways of financing a business. First, you have equity finance which is investing money in return for ownership of the company. So this is typically your own money, money from friends or, friends or family, and money from people who believe, believe in your cause and want to invest money into your company uh, for a possible return in the future on how much money you make. Uh, 
Uh, next is debt financing. So this is investing funds in return for the funds back in the future plus interest. Uh, common sources include business loans and lines of credit. So this is money that uh, people loan you and they want the money back in the future plus a little bit on top, but they don't necessarily uh, depend on how well your business is going. So uh, the third way is grants. So these are funds that is invested in your company in return for limitations on how those funds are spent. So these are typically in the form of government grants. Uh, you can apply for these grants, but they typically restrict you on how you spend this money. For example, they may say you must spend this money on planting X number of trees. You must spend this money on achieving X or X or X. And if you don't, they may ask for that money back. Fourth way is donations. So donations are investment of funds with the expectations that they will achieve a social good. Typically, there's no restrictions on how these funds are spent, but you know, people invest this money with expectation of you'll be achieving what your mission is. Um, now here's a couple of do's and don'ts when you're considering which source of financing to go for. Uh, do try to invest your own money or money in the form of equity financing. Uh, debt financing, uh, financing with restrictions is typically uh, more risky as if you fail to meet those restrictions, then you have to repay those funds, which may be unexpected and uh, may cause you to incur severe penalties. Uh, don't borrow without a plan. So we went over budgeting and the cash flow projection, and it's extremely important to have a plan in place before you borrow money. And it's extremely important to know what you're going to do with your money. Because if you borrow without a plan, then you will, you may, you're likely to incur extra costs in, in terms of, uh, more higher interest rate as uh, the sources of financing are less likely to give you money if they don't know what you're going to do with it. Uh, do understand collateral. So collateral is an important, area, uh, important uh, piece of uh, kind of contractual agreement that banks use to protect their bank loan. Uh, they may say, if the bank uh, gives you money, they may say, put your house up as collateral, put your car, car up as collateral. And if you fail to repay that money, they may seize these assets from you. So uh, do not put up any collateral if, you, if you're if you unwilling to part with the asset that you're putting up as collateral, which is the advice that I would give, because you never know what may happen. And if you lose your house over a business that you've started, it can cause a lot of uh, angst and issues. Uh, don't tie money up in non-cash assets. So we went over the, the balance sheet. And you, know, you may look at your balance sheet and say, oh, I have X number of dollars in inventory, X number of dollars in equipment, I'm fine. But the problem is, the thing with non-cash assets is it's difficult to convert those assets into cash, and, and if you're repaying a liability or obligation, they want cash typically. So you may have a lot of assets, but if you have no cash, you may still be uh, incurring a lot of penalties. Uh, do earn the right to borrow. Before you go to uh, sources of financing, be it friends, family, or bank, make sure you do your homework and make sure you do know how you're going to spend that money. That's the most, most, most likely way you're going to be able to invest your business. And you know it's good to make sure that you have a good plan in place because once you get that money, it can be difficult to figure out what you're going to do with it if you haven't planned for it in advance. Uh, don't over leverage a company. Don't borrow too much money. Um, if you borrow too much money, then if any kind of issues happen, uh, you may not be able to repay that money. Uh, the advantage of uh, equity financing is that there's typically no strict expectation on when they want the money back, whereas with debt financing, there's typically a schedule you need to keep. Now, with equity financing, if your business has a rough patch, you can maybe get through it with the promise of paying in the future, whereas debt, there's typically less flexibility. Uh, do get expert advice. These are kind of high-level overviews of what everybody should do, but uh, every situation is unique in its own way. And uh, if you're considering investing a lot of money into a company, make sure you get advice on your individual situation because um, a lot of times, a lot of unexpected events happen and that could cause a lot of issues if you're not prepared for it. Uh, next, I'll go over tax planning. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to go over tax planning very briefly, and it's a difficult topic to cover in a presentation such as this. Uh, but uh, I will just give a couple of tips to start with. Uh, one of the first considerations when you're starting your business is how to structure your business. Uh, and the two of the most common ways are a sole proprietorship versus a, versus a corporation. So a sole proprietorship is where you start your business and you run it and you don't start a company. Uh, you would report all of your income as personal income and you report all of your expenses as personal expenses. A corporation is where uh, you, set, you set up a separate legal entity, a separate person almost, and you flow through everything related to 
uh, your business through that entity and keeping everything personal on your own. Now, the advantage of a sole proprietorship is that it's easy, it's inexpensive, you can start it right away, and you can run it uh, without too much overhead costs. Uh, there's lower regulatory requirements, and there's not as much uh, overhead and paperwork that you have to do with a sole proprietorship, as everything is on you. And third advantage is you have direct control of decision making when you're in a sole proprietorship. You make all the decisions, uh, but again, here's the downside, you also incur all the costs, and uh, that may be an issue. So the main advantages of a corporation is you have a limited liability, which means uh, if your business, uh, God forbid, loses money, you're limited to the amount of money you invested in the company. So uh, since you're, you're separate entities, the bank or whoever can only come after your company for uh, the money that it owes them, and your uh, kind of liability is how much money you've contributed. So let's say your business goes belly up, uh, the company can't, uh, the bank can't come after you personally for anything. They have to go through the corporation. That is the main advantage of a corporation. The other advantage is, is easier to raise capital. Uh, I guess this ties back to the decision making issue we discussed before. Whereas in a corporation, uh, you're not the only owner of the corporation. You can give up ownership of the corporation, pieces of the ownership, 10%, 20%, to other people in return for their investment of money. And they have legal right to that 10 or 20% that you give up. Caveat to this, don't give up too much of your company. I've seen that before and it's unpleasant. Uh, and also there are possible, well, there are probable tax advantages. Corporations typically pay a lower tax rate than a sole proprietorship would and are uh, eligible for more tax deductions than a sole proprietorship would. But again, along comes with more overhead costs and more uh, additional headaches. Uh, my recommendation would be if you're starting off a business, you don't have a solid plan in place, uh, you're just trying to get things off the ground, start with a sole proprietorship. Once you've got a business going, you know you're going to be generating money, you're going to be generating an impact, you're going to be paying people, that's when you convert it into a corporation. Uh, the other main consideration is registering your business. So the CRA, uh, the Canada Revenue Agency, uh, doesn't consider tax implications of a corporation until you register your business with uh, the CRA. Now, there's kind of a gray area here, but you can consider kind of on a high level, you know, don't take my word for it. A sole proprietorship, you don't need to register. Corporation, you do. Again, don't take my word for that, but that's kind of how you can look at it. Uh, and, you know, some of the ways you can consider uh, whether or not you need to register your business are, one, do you need to file GST or HST? And what that means is, as a corporation, if you pay for a supply, so you buy something or you pay an employee and you pay tax on that, you can get that money back from the CRA um, as a business kind of cost, you can look at it. So if you plan to do that, you need to register your business. Second, if you hire employees, you need to register your business as that is how the CRA keeps track of payroll deductions and all that kind of stuff. Uh, if you do register your business, know that you need to keep your record for six years. So you need to, so if you register your business, there's a possibility that the CRA will come audit you. And when they come audit you, they have the expectation that you have all of your records for six years. This means all of your business costs, all of your receipts, all of your records. If you don't have that, your audits will go badly. That's not good. Uh, again, if you register your business, there's special rules for bringing your personal assets into your business. So you can start your company. If you want to use your personal laptop for the company as a business, you have just deductions, you can get on that. But there are special rules for how you can use that asset, how you can bring that asset into your business. Again, these are all extra overhead costs that may not be worth it when you're starting your company, but definitely worth it once you've gotten your business off the ground and running. Uh, it says my messenger is now inactive. Um, Just the That's fine. Okay, sorry. And uh, so that was okay. So that was a basic introduction to tax planning. There's a lot of other areas of tax planning that I haven't gone over. Um, there are several sources of tax planning getting help. Uh, the CRA has tax clinics and tax seminars that they hold uh, regularly that you can attend that will give you uh, kind of the basics of what you need to know beyond what I've talked about here. The CRA does have a video series for starting your business that you can look into uh, accessing for, uh, and it'll give you a lot of information, uh, you know, including what I've went through here, but a lot more information on top of that for how you can do tax planning when you're just starting your business. The h &R Block is also a great resource. They offer free tax consultations, free basic tax consultations that you can look into um, accessing, where they will likely try to sell you on 
hiring their services, but they will also give you a lot of good information that you can use. So that is the end of our presentation. We can open it up to questions. All right, so I just want to remind everyone that if you'd like to uh, raise your hand, uh, there is a place around your name where you can um, raise your hand or you can type in your questions into the chat function. Um, so I see there's already a question here, uh, which is, is there a comprehensive list of assets that we can refer to? Um, we haven't prepared anything directly, um, but that's something that we can give to Marjorie offline. Um, just kind of a general listing of the typical kind of assets or examples that you would expect to see on, on a balance sheet um, and uh, the kind of standard classifications that you that you could use as a reference. Um, that Would that be possible, Marjorie? That yeah, you, sure. That we could provide yep. as part of the, the example. And, um, and likewise, not just for the assets, we could um, provide it for for the entire balance sheet and, um, and uh, profit and loss statement as well. Okay, perfect, and just for folks, um, the person who's speaking is Kelly Bragg, so she has now joined us, uh, joined the presentation. And Hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, are there any other questions about the presentation? Okay, um, well here we have one here, which is, do you see a difference in financial focus for those with the social impact initiative? Which Somewhat covered, but maybe you can amplify. Um, absolutely, and I, th I think that's um, what we were trying to draw out in this presentation is um, is that the typical business is is for profit, um, and the the mission statement um, for most business companies is is to generate a profit and keep their shareholders um, happy by doing so. Whereas with the, the social the social um, companies, um, it's it's a it's a different type of reporting. Um, and a different, uh, different audience that you're talking to that aren't necessarily concerned with the profits. I mean, um, granted that the profits would, you still need to be profitable, that you can go ahead and run your business um, and, and maintain um, that, that ongoing existence, if you will, but it's not the sole purpose of a company where you would be generating these social benefits. Um, and that's where, where in Peter's section, we were trying to draw that out. It's important um, showing that you know you don't have a going concern for the business in, in terms of your profit profitability, that you will be able to continue your function. But it is also um, it is there's also a separate component um, for uh, social entrepreneurs where you would want to also be tracking the social benefits and costs. Um, and Peter touched on it where it it wouldn't follow your your normal reporting conventions, um, you know, in, in business we talk dollars, um, and that is, that's the, the common language of the business. Everybody can, can speak to that very comfortably in business settings, and it's almost uh, now a combination of that where everything you won't be able to necessarily quantify, um, and that's where that qualitative analysis um, really comes into play and in building that up in your reporting on how how those benefits are being generated, even if you can't qualitatively measure them um, in dollars and cents, um, making sure that you're still drawing that out to people that do have a stakehold in your company, um, that you've considered this and this is um, this is the benefit you're, you're achieving um, the objective of your company. And I'll just add one thing, which is that um, uh, this presentation is primarily focused on uh, companies, social enterprises, and small businesses that have been incorporated as basically for-profit companies. Um, many people in the social enterprise sector also look at sort of not-for-profit structures um, and, uh, and and even charities that do run uh, revenue-generating businesses. Uh, the accounting and the, all the sort of cash flow statements, income statements, all those things um, look very, very similar in those contexts, but there may be some differences. So you wouldn't have, say, say for instance, owner's equity. Um, it would be around, um, uh, I've forgotten what the term is. I think it's fund like net, net fund, fund, pardon? Uh, fund accounting. Fund accounting, okay. I, I'm from the, so here's my dirty secrets that I'm, I'm from the U.S. So we, I think <laughs> we use a different term in the U.S., but um, the, the point is that the, the, the statements are analogous, but a little bit different. Um, and um, yeah, 
Yeah, in in essence, you'd still want to be tracking, you know, uh, your cat your cash flow um, would remain the same, very much to what Peter talked to, um, and you'd still want to be tracking those assets and liabilities, um, but the way you present them is slightly different, mm -hmm. um, and which is what Marjorie's getting. At. Yeah. Um, so I'll bring up another uh, question, which is, how much does a bookkeeper cost, and do I need one? Um, difficult question. I think it, it, uh, it's a case-by-case -case basis on how much support you need as your business, um, just given the size of your business, the complexity, um, how evolved you are. I think it's, it's a difficult question to ask um, without knowing what type of support you need. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that has a variable cost. As Peter said, you could start out with the H&R blocks that kind of provide those core foundational um, services, um, just like a, a regular bookkeeper as well, um, that would start on the low end and then you can grow from there. Um, again, depending on the complexity of your business, it would really um, depend, would be dependent on the cost. Okay, so this is maybe a related question, but what are the basic financial tools I need for a new startup? So I, I think, like, you know, can can someone just use QuickBooks and be able to manage their 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 finance as well, just with that alone? Um, it depends how comfortable um, I'd say you are with numbers. And some people open up QuickBooks and just based on their schooling are able to navigate through it very comfortably. Where whereas others we others just don't have a mind for it. Um, and that's just not their expertise and aren't comfortable dealing with it. And that's where you'd want to look at um, hiring an external bookkeeper to mm -hmm. kind of support you in that function. Um, but I'd say a typical startup, you could, that, that's what um, software products like QuickBooks are really made for, it's those startup companies um, and, and using that. Yeah, and I'll just flag, I mean, we're, we live in a, a, a really wonderful time of the internet where if you want to know something, you can probably find it out. I mean, there are just tons and tons and tons of tutorials online. Uh, the purpose of, of today's webinar is really just to expose everyone to the different concepts and uh, around financial management. But if there is anything you really wanted to know about, you can always do a deep dive on the internet. Um, there are lots of free courses here in um, Ontario. And uh, if there's something that we covered today that you want to know more about, just let us know and we'll see if we can get you some more resources on that. Absolutely. I think that's one of the benefits of, of um, the types of organizations like this, where um, you know, you're know you not for profit, you are having that, that social benefit impact where you're going to have a lot more exposure to people wanting to get involved and helping out with these types of businesses. So, so really, you know, it's just getting the word out um, and, and drawing on those opportunities where people may be willing to donate their time to you um, versus other, you know, for-profit in industries. And Peter just had a great point um, drawing out resources um, from local schools, universities, colleges, where people may be looking for experience um, to build up their resume, um, where they have the knowledge and um, and start just starting those, their career, where which could be kind of cost-effective um, arrangements for you to explore. Great, and I just wanna um, flag that uh, if you are on the phone and you'd like to ask a question, all you need to do is uh, press star nine um, that will allow you to raise your hand and then you can also press star six uh, to mute yourself uh, so everyone should be able to do that now uh, a question from one um, uh, from the audience can you please send us uh, the slides of this presentation and so yes the answer is yes we will send the, the slides and uh, you'll be able to uh, refer back to this presentation at your convenience uh, okay another question we have is I really only have a little time to manage the money side. What kind of financial management is the bare minimum I can do and still stay on track? <laughs> I, uh, yeah, again, I think the bare, min the bare minimum, quotations, is, um, is dependent on, on, again, a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if you're just a startup, you're looking to just maintain um, the operational function, I think, uh, to Pete's point, it's probably primarily driven on your cash flows. If um, you know you don't have, if you aren't required to report um, your financials to any stakeholders, whether it be the bank or, or um, CRA or, or people investing in your company through, through fundraising, 
um, just in terms of the day-to-day -day operations, it's really critical that cash flow analysis that that um, Peter walked through and making sure that you you understand what's coming into the business and what's flowing out and you're able to manage that. Um, the, the accounting rules are more for the, the business side, um, you know, giving the banks comfort in, in what you're doing and, um, and your stakeholders comfort in what you're doing from that technical side. But in terms of the operational um, management, it's, it's really primarily driven by that cash flow. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so another question is tips to plan a budget as a self-employed person when you don't have a consistent income. <laughs> yeah, not to be redundant, um, but it's really that cash flow statement. Um, that you're going to be drawing a lot of that information to. And um, as Pete mentioned, as, as a new company, um, it may be difficult um, to kind of plan for that as your the influxes um, will vary typically more at the start of a business. But once you start building up that historical trending and you've kind of gone through a couple cycles of the business, you can kind of get a feel for when people are paying things, how long it takes to collect the money when, um, versus, um, you know, your payment terms that you may have coming out of your typical expenses in terms of your rent or your other overhead costs um, and really getting that feel. Um, it's, uh, that, that would be, again, the primary tool that you would draw that from. Okay, perfect. Uh, here's a question that was just, how can you make reoccurring processes like monthly reconciliations and annual audits as simple and efficient as possible? <laughs> um, that is something that we struggle with as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it, it goes to say for all sizes of business. Um, uh, for us that we, regardless of size, it's, it's good to document your process. Um, and have a good understanding of what that expectation is. Um, so then that way you have consistency and that's what you're looking for when you're implementing those type of controls um, that, that you're doing the same thing over and over in order to get that control result that you're looking for. Um, and, and I would draw, again, Marjorie's point, draw off of examples um, of off the internet. There's a lot of information that's available there um, and, and researching the type of, you know, con a lot of these processes may already be documented for you. You may be able to leverage a lot off of what you're able to find there. And again, um, looking for, for resources um, from local schools, I'd say would be a great opportunity as well in terms of just even developing these type of controls. Um, they're very uh, kind of standard controls that, that most accountant types would be used to um, that would be able to help you through that process. Okay, you know, one, one of the things that I've seen as an evolution in nonprofit finance, and this might be happening in for profit as well, is just that we have more apps that we can use so we can, you know, immediately scan a receipt and then it, it gets coded or uh, things that are coming on a credit card immediately get, uh, put, you know, journaled in a particular way so that that reduces the amount of, of, of back-end work that we have to do down the line. Right. You're not, you know, three months down the line being like, oh, oh crap, I haven't touched my financial statements. <laughs> Where did that receipt go? Um, we we experience that here internally as well, um, that we're able to draw off of a lot of the technology evolutions that and, and um, real-time um, monitoring and tracking tools that are now available today. Yeah. Um, and sorry, going back to the, the reconciliations as well, like a lot of um, the standard software um, would have that type of tool available as well. So if you're reporting it already in your ledger, it would draw it already through um, to, you know, your reconciliation template. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so this question, I, given that a lot of social entrepreneurs are just sort of getting off the ground, or a lot of the ones in our community, they're just getting off the ground. And so there's a, there's a, they're more familiar with the personal finance versus the, the corporate finance. And I'm just wondering, or there's a question here is, how do you manage personal finances versus business finance when you're running the two? The two. Um, that um, is, I think Kenny and Pete were drawing that out in the presentation and, and really making sure that um, if you are 
if the intent is not to be using your personal finances, to really make sure that you are keeping separate accounts um, is, is the first kind of intent um, for, for not only tax purposes, but you know, reporting back to your stakeholders, making sure that you've got that clear definition between your personal expenses and your, your now new business expenses. Um, and then, sorry, what was it? Just say, was there, are there any tips around making sure you're managing the personal finances? Yeah, I, I'd say the, the key difference now between your personal and, and the, in your new business would be the, um, the audience of your reporting. Mm -hmm. For your personal side, I mean, you're doing that obviously for your personal benefit, whereas for the business side, you now have a, a broader audience that you that would be using those financial results, um, whether it be the bank again or your investors or um, going back to to your own monitoring of the business and how you're tracking. I'd say that the two key distinctions is making sure that you've got separate identifiable accounts and and making sure that you're now for your business you're reporting in a way that um, people invested in your business can use and and benefit from the analysis that you're doing okay. well i don't see any other questions i'll give a chance to the audience to have any final questions before we um, move to close okay I don't see anything so um, but if you change your mind uh, feel free to reach out to us we are always here for you uh, and I want to just thank Peter Kelly and um, Kenny for this great presentation you've been so helpful uh, we will send the, the slide deck and I also want to flag that there are a bunch of other webinars coming up over the next couple of months uh, you can find a list of those at uh, our website www.ssbontario.org uh, and if you click on courses and workshops, you'll find the, the links there. Uh, we'll also send out a link to the um, course listing on Eventbrite. Um, so on behalf of SSE and RSA, uh, we want to thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you.